गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन आई मंजुला एस बिरादर असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर इलेक्ट्रिकल एंड इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स इंजीनियरिंग डिपार्टमेंट विल बी योर होस्ट फॉर टूडे वेलकम टू द वेबिनार ऑन ग्रोइंग एनर्जी डिमांड्स ऑफ इंडिया हाउ कैन दे बी मेट ऑर्गेनाइज बाय इलेक्ट्रिकल एंड इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स इंजीनियरिंग डिपार्टमेंट एस टी बी आई टी इन एसोसिएशन विद रिसर्च एंड डेवलपमेंट सेल आई एंड एसोसिएशन ऑफ present we welcome okay good afternoon everyone uh, this is dr supanay shirguppe head of the department of electrical and electronics engineering sg balekundri institute of technology belagavi so seeking the blessings of his holiness dr shivabasav mahaswami ji and the blessings of his holiness dr sidrama mahaswami ji i take this opportunity to welcome you all to today's live webinar on growing energy demands of india how can they be met so today we have a very distinguished guest speaker with us mr pavan kumar p who is a market intelligence leader a south asia from general electric so we are highly privileged to have you here sir um he will be giving an insight into the possible ways to meet the growing energy demands of our country so on behalf of the uh, department of electrical and electronics engineering uh, the sgbit idripple student branch and the sgbit r&d cell i extend a very warm welcome to you sir thank you i also welcome the student participants who have shown uh, student and faculty participants who have shown keen interest in being a part of our event so next i welcome our beloved principal dr sidramappa vet who is our motivator guide and the driving force behind the conduction of this event i welcome you sir i also welcome dr shridhar ayer sgbit r&d cell coordinator professor lalita darba counselor sgbit idripple student branch heads of various departments and all my colleagues to this webinar organized by the electrical and electronics department in association with r&d cell and the sgbit idripple student branch so welcome you all once again thank you over to you uh, professor manjula yes thank you ma'am uh, i request professor lalita darba to introduce to our participants the presenter for today's webinar lalita ma'am Uh, thanks uh, manjula am i audible words may inspire but it is action that creates a change i lalita darbha branch counselor sgpit idripple feel privileged and honored to introduce today's resource person and my friend pavan kumar pillal mari who has a varied experience which in includes plc programming erp the and the business intelligence solutions he pursued btech with uh, electronics and communication engineering stream in the year 1998 from G gprc karnool later pursued his mba in finance stream and completed accelerated general management program from indian institute of management ahmedabad He worked as a junior manager in ITC Badrachalam from July 1998 to July 2000. Uh, he was working as a ERP consultant from July 2000 to May 2001 in Polaris Software. Later, he shifted to General Electric uh, Energy uh, and worked there as a team lead and uh, project manager. from 2001 to 2007 and then uh, changed as a project manager from 2007 and uh, continued till march 2011 currently is working as a program director from march 2011 till date and his uh, one of his contribution which uh, we all could be proud of is that uh, he is uh, during his tenure he has uh, realized 
productivity savings to the tune of over hundred thousand uh, dollars. I I actually wanted him to elaborate on this also. I request uh, Pawan, uh, sir, please. And then uh, uh, the award that he received include best green belt project award, management award for record ERP implementation, best quality award for cycle time reduction, best team award for customer centricity, best product award for configuration management. Uh, with this brief introduction, I I thank uh, Pawan sir for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, I hope the se session will be uh, a bit motivating and learning for all of us here. Uh, over to you, Manjula. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for doing the needful. Uh, Pawan sir, you may take over the session from now. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for having me here and you know, uh, all the kind words that uh, Lalita ma'am had talked about me. I, I hope I can live up to that uh, in the next few minutes that we will spend here. Uh, so the projects that she talked about where we did a lot of savings and all uh, just to be kind of to the point and then we'll get on to the session itself is uh, this is way before. Uh, maybe 10 years back or something when 100k seems to be probably bigger than it is today. So this is this was when we did uh, uh, what we today call data science analytics. We kind of did some projects around that and proactively monitored our performance in terms of key business parameters on orders and sales and kind of let our the CEOs of the company know how the company is doing. So that's what uh, it, it was all about uh, 10, 12 years back when we did this project. So let, let me uh, get on to the topic for today. So I hope I can share my screen and you guys can tell me if uh, you can see my screen. Just let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, sir, we are able to see it. OK, thank you. OK, so getting into the topic itself, uh, India's growing energy demands and how are they going to be met? So this is a topic that I wanted to discuss with people uh, who are on the call uh, because I thought this is something that would interest them because all of us are in the electrical space and trying to figure out what we can do to meet our ever growing demands in, 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 in India, right? So just wanted to start off with some facts. These are facts that we might know, might not know, but just wanted to kind of put them out there. India is the fifth largest economy in the world now. We just overtook UK last year. This is uh, authentic data despite the COVID-19 crisis. India is the fifth largest economy in the world and it's later to go to number three by 2040. So that's it. That's a big number that we'll need to look at. In, in 215 odd countries, we are about number five in terms of economy size. Then some staggering numbers, third largest electricity producer across the globe again. We have the second largest popula population. This is something that we get heard quite a lot and we keep hearing about uh, uh, our population and how we will overtake China at some point of time and then come down again and, and whatnot. But this is a number that we probably know. And then we have the la third largest installed power capacity. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, people on the call will realize capacity from generation. So there are two different aspects. We I could have a capacity of 100 gigawatts, but maybe I produce only 50. So uh, so there is a different difference, but in either of the scales, India is the third largest, both in producing and also having the capacity to produce. OK, so these are some facts that I wanted to put out there so that it gives us a context of what we are talking in terms of scale. So traditionally, this is again moving slides. I don't know if it came up, but this is our projections. Traditionally, if you look at this, the, the numbers look on the I don't know if the numbers are clear, but the maroon colored ones are the share of percentage of how our power generation happens in India 2018. And our market intelligence with a lot of data modeling and, and inputs from the industry across, across the board. These are our projections of how the 
fuel gets mixed in India. So today, 74% of our power comes from coal, all the thermal power plants. Natural gas, which always has been a very small portion, is 4%. Nuclear, very small again, probably will grow in some time. And then hydro, about 9%. Bioenergy, wind, though we see quite a lot of wind turbines, it's still 4% of the population. And then solar, we are just about starting. But if you turn around, move this forward 20 years, 2040, these are our projections. Coal becomes drastically shortened, 74 to 47. Still considerable. I mean, it's like close to 50% of our power generation, but but a drastic dip in how the energy would be generated in, in, in India. So gas, nuclear, not much change, but the big changes are from wind and solar. Solar, in fact, has the rapid growth from 3% it goes to 23. It's like really going off the roof. So and, and wind also going threefold from 4% to 11. So we, we, we expect that coal will still remain in the game because that remains cheap and available in India. So coal is still expected to play quite a big role in India, but then we also see the renewables grow up. And I wanted to kind of talk about again, we will talk about this in a little more depth in a, a future slide where we talk about the RTC, the round the clock initiative that the government has come out with and how can that help us, right? So the switch of renewables and, and how that will impact us and, and all that. So let's talk about that. But just a story that tells you here is we are heavily dependent on coal today. We will be heavily dependent on coal 2040, but the numbers will kind of come down because the the rate at rate of growth of renewables is much faster than uh, the rate of uh, deceleration of uh, the coal. So we said coal is what drives India, but will it impact us otherwise? It does because CO2 emissions, which are a big role in our whole pollution discussion that we keep having, and that picture is actually on one fine morning in the NCR region, you could see that there is hardly anything that you could see. They call it fog, they call it, you know, harvest crop burning, whatever. But power sector has a huge social responsibility to fill because among all industries, power sector gives out the CO2 the maximum. And in fact, India made a commitment to the world in the in the the climate summit that happened in Paris a few years back where we said we will control our CO2, we will shift to renewables faster, we will not, I mean, we, we kind of committed to a specific megatons of carbon output. So coal can't grow, has to be shrunk because of the commitments that we made to the world at large and, and to ourselves in terms of better living quality, but if you looked at the highlighted row that I have there, coal still pushes 96% of the CO2 emissions today and in 2040. So, so that's a big problem that we all have to look at, and it's a real problem. There are, I mean, our numbers tell us that about 1.5 million people die each year in India alone due to exposed conditions of pollution. We're not saying that CO2 is the evil kill it. I mean, there is particulate matter, there is <clears throat> sulfur, there, is, there are other elements as well that contribute. But this is something that's out there for us as a power sector team. I'm including all of you where we will need to do something about it. Right. So this is this is something a train of thought I wanted us to remember and capture that we have this issue of coal generating the maximum power and with it coming this implication of pollution. OK, so that's another thought of mine that I wanted to plant. And then this is. Very, very important to look at. 
this chart tells a story in itself. This is charting the electricity demand for just three sample points for us to get a feel for it. At the very top, this is per capita electricity demand, meaning how many, how much each person in one country uses on an annual basis. So you see USA is at the very top, close to 12,000. This is terawatts. And then world average itself is close to 6,000, something like that. And then if you look at India, India is not even close to 2000. In fact, these numbers, if I redo it for 2020, the numbers will go down further for everyone because of the COVID impact. Every The demand has actually gone down this year. But just an indicator that there is a big gap in how much India as an average Indian citizen uses versus the rest of the world versus, uh, I don't know if we should call it best in class or whatever, but USA, which is really at the top of the pie, right? We really don't want to go there because that will mean, uh, I mean, our, our capacities and our, uh, our generation capacities will never go that high, but we, the growing middle class and the growing need for providing electricity for everyone in India. And, and if you must have heard the government of India talking about electricity for all, all the rural villages getting electrified, they actually went and made a statement last year that they have power. I mean, they have kind of power in every village. But if you really look at it, they don't have 24 by 7 reliable, affordable power yet. So there is a lot of scope for this demand to grow even further. So our estimate, we are talking about 2030, which is about 10 years from now, is when the electricity that is supplied to remote parts of the country also will be affordable as well as reliable. Because if you if they are not reliable, and affordable, then you know the government pushes it, pushes the line, but then they can't really pay the bills. So, uh, so we are expecting that this demand to sh I mean, kind of keep growing. If you look at the chart itself, it starts from you know, 1980 onwards. But our data from India perspective started only post liberalization, if you will. So that's that's when you know the the curve started for us. So this trend of upward journey for India will continue. The demands will keep going up and that's where the capacity, the generation piece has to pick up. So the supply side has to go up because the demand side is going up. OK, uh, again, something for all of us to uh, realize that there is a need to actively work on the supply, sorry, generation side, the supply side. So here we come to renewables because we talked about um, the, the demand going up and what we can do on the wind side. This is purely wind play uh, projections where the wind and solar are going going in, in the like in the first slide, right? So India government actually says that we have 37.5 gigawatts of wind capacity as of last year. But then over the next years, we are actually saying that we will double and we will quadruple. So we are saying by six, we will get to 60 megawatts by 2030. Right. So it's, a, it's I mean, again, don't want to kind of get caught up with the numbers, but this is very ambitious goal that the government has set for all of us that it will keep growing. But then there are challenges on wind here. Land acquisition is a big challenge in India. Um, uh, and because a power producer who is going to install those huge wind turbines will need to have hassle free land reforms. Again, I'm talking policy here where you know probably our academic friends like all of you might not have too much play there, but just giving you out an example that if a independent power producer wants to set up this wind farm that company has to go through a lot of hurdles because they have to acquire the land. They've get, got to get environmental clearances. I mean, it's it's a lot of red tape there. So and the cost of producing the electricity uh, 
is high because of all these red tapes and also the the very fact that the scale of wind has still not gone all that high so the the turbine i mean the the, the rotor that rotates and produces uh, the wind uh, that cost is still a little higher currently it will go down and that's why you know the the rate of generation will go up too so we are still at that cusp where we are supposed to take off if you look at the chart itself 2020 here we are solar and wind kind of taking on but this has a lot of um, iffy part because we need a very good um, project administration team across whoever is running this to be able to deliver on time the land reforms are done and, and whatnot so whatever you see are projections coming from um, actually this this came from energy outlook um, international energy outlook so it is these are projections from them saying that this is how the i mean the data would go up and and another piece i just quickly get to solar solar is a big friend of us because you know we have 300 days in an year which will have ample sunshine so it's it's a big uh, plus for india's uh, uh, growing needs of energy but then the challenge there in the solar side is we don't manufacture panels to a large extent we just import them so if we are dependent on a country that's bordering us where we have actively engaged defense or armies from both the sides and india is actually putting um, uh, we are we are we are actually imposing customs and anti dump duty etc again probably a little economics here but i'll just quickly talk about it if a country is trying to export something to us and we are saying that if you sell here you the indian producers have to pay more to get them then they would not want to bring them here right so i would obviously want to not buy things from china because that's the logical thing but then at the same time if you're not developed local manufacturing facilities or alternate sources for your components the solar growth even though we are expecting it to grow very high will not happen because you're not planned for these other situations like the border tensions no one expected that last year so all in all renewables have a very important role for india and uh, to be able to meet our energy demands but then the policy and the execution will need to be spot on for the you know, the renewables to take off uh, even with the renewables now we'll come to this is this is probably the meat of what i wanted to talk about and of course uh, we can have a conversation after this um, uh, the slides that get over to on to your left you see all types of energy that get generated biomass geothermal solar wind hydro tidal thermal nuclear i think we don't have my own uh, my business's uh, representation which is gas uh, so i would kind of loosely talk about thermal being both coal and natural gas driven so the only difference being the coal will be driven I mean, driving primarily the steam turbine whereas the gas turbines are used in the natural gas world so these are all different sets of um, uh, pro i mean producers if you will for energy on the left side and then what happens is if we are going towards this initiative of i want everything renewable i want very little carbon footprint the downside of that would be obviously where these renewables are highly intermittent they are not reliable always you might have you might actually have very good sunshine today and then maybe tomorrow you have a rain and then even with the wind today there might be wind gusts blowing and all our coastal area is very well equipped you would probably capture that but tomorrow if there is no gust there is no uh, regular um, wind coming from the sea across so that's when 
the renewables will become very, very intermittent. They are not uh, reliable to produce energy that is acceptable by everyone at all times. It can't give us 24 by 7. That That's pretty clear, right? So, for example, now in the COVID situation, we have people admitted into hospitals, admitted into ICUs, admitted into you know, the higher range of ICUs, etc. And then they are looking for oxygen supply all the time. So if we, let's say, I mean, taking an analogy, if oxygen were to be only available between, you know, morning eight to evening six, which is when our solar kind of peaks up, right? It's not acceptable for a patient who needs to be on oxygen. So that's when you can't say oxygen will come only from one source, eight to six, and after that, the patient has to live by himself. Just not possible. So you have to manage the whole 24 by seven by adding different layers of uh, of your energy sources and keep them 24 by 7 running. So the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, MNRE, is floated a tender, floated a concept that we are actively working on, and I'm sure this is what I was kind of referring to, to Dr. Sridhar earlier on when he was asking me about uh, this whole project. We need people to actively engage here. This is the government saying we want to provide 24 by 7, but then we want to combine the renewables with thermal slash gas is what we are saying. So we have to, as a group, people who want India to succeed in the, in the race of uh, sustainable electricity and, and affordable electricity for everyone, we need to make sure that we have a solution around tapping the renewables for a longer period in, in the battery storage. We also need effective bundling of renewable power with the thermal power. Thermal, I mean coal and gas, actually gas and coal, my preference would be because gas produces much less CO2 and you know it is it is much less carbon intensive so that we bring the cost of power down because you will have reliability of power always a power plant can be switched on switch off actually not switched off but switched on pretty quickly and the power output comes pretty fast and you would also supplement the intermittent intermittent issues of uh, the, the renewable power and also meet the requirements of the, the discoms meaning distribution companies. So distribution companies always need 24 by 7. So we kind of combine the two and produce an output that's meeting all these requirements of the ministry. So I would again, this is this is a challenge for all of us to be able to meet. They are still trying to do a proof of concept that's and then we as a company from a GE perspective, we are also uh, trying to help help the government, help the country here. And I'm sure this is a challenge that you guys can think of and figure out innovative solutions here. But this is just the concept coming from the ministry itself. Uh, and then um, just illustration, right? This again is this is how the hours of the day look like and how the power generation happens today in 2020 versus 2040 our projection where the electricity demand is pretty static if you look at it and the cost is pretty static because most of it comes from coal and and the energy needs are also so high so low you're looking at 200 gigawatt per hour so that that's country and that's for india 2020 and there is very little solar and very little wind um, if you look at the chart there but fast forward to 2040, the needs are much higher. Solar goes up, wind goes up. But then if you don't balance the power system itself, you have to have, I mean, you will have problems. You, you should have flexibility of power system where you can switch on the thermal, keep it running. And when uh, solar turns on, meaning one part of the day, if you look at it, at, it peaks at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, right? 12 o'clock in the afternoon, you get maximum output from sun. So that's when 
you know, you slowly taper down the coal and other sources, and you use maximum coming from the solar, and then you also have um, you also have wind running, and then that is uh, the next piece is where it is going to be very critical would be the storage piece. If we if we solve this storage problem, and this is I'm sure all of you uh, will have heard and will have been working on anyway on the storage challenge where we are currently not able to store beyond a certain number of hours. So if we store this energy for a longer duration and be able to sustain it and, and kind of connect to the grid as required and the size of the storage capacity also today, each battery that stores this energy is very huge in terms of bulk size. So it has to be smaller, it has to be uh, flexible and, and capable to store more for more time. I think that's a challenge that is thrown probably at all the academics and also the research scientists that who are working on this piece. And funnily enough, these ups and downs, the crests and troughs of the whole generation cycles, we call them duck curves. Looks like a duck and we're calling them ducks, duck curves. So the duck curves will have to be managed well. We have to have good storage. We have to have the ability to combine the renewables with the thermal slash gas. And then hydro, of course, will keep going down because you know the rate at which we can build new hydro projects will be smaller because we probably captured most of our rivers and built those uh, reservoirs already. So the future if you just looked at this is what we're saying is renewables is going to play a big role of course and what we are promoting is a combination of not just renewables but also gas because that is when we will address our power requirements and also the carbon emissions remember if i always only do coal we went back a few slides back where we said coal is probably good for economic reasons for India, but then bad for our overall goal of meeting the carbon emissions, the commitment that we made to the, you know, the World Climate Summit. So the, the 60 gig, again, remember this number, very, very critical. I hope uh, people can uh, focus on why we want to solve this problem. We will have 60 gigawatts of the global battery storage, which is 220. So we are talking about 25 to 30 percent of the global market to be in India by 2040. So the sooner the, the 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 groups who are working on this challenge come out with solutions, the market size is actually staring at us more than 25 percent close to 30% of the market will be right here in India in terms of battery storage. So this is a challenge that I hope all of us will rise and work on. OK, so this is this is the most important thing that I think we we want to look at and figure out what we can do in terms of uh, uh, the next future. So just kind of taking the story a little further, uh, and this is something that we are advocating, not just here, but globally is we are saying it's a complementary nature of both renewables and gas power that will need to be looked at. And, and for a variety of reasons, the wind, the solar and the storage, there is no fuel requirement. They don't need anything to run. I mean, there is no, uh, money that you need to invest in an ongoing going basis. Solar is free, wind is free, storage. Of course, there is a capex that you need to buy. You've got to buy for once and then it runs. And then on the gas side, what we are saying, this is global, not necessarily applicable 100% to India because we still see gas being a problem in terms of uh, the supply because uh, our supply of gas power is limited. But what we are saying is it's flexible. If you get natural gas or LNG, um, I think most of the coastal part of Gujarat actually runs pretty well on the gas power. 
and in a portion of Tamil Nadu also has good res resources and then we have Northeast which has very good uh, resources and a little in Mangalore, I think close to you guys, uh, the Gale has good gas power resources. The rest of the country has a problem. We still have to build good pipelines and if it's done, then if the gas power is used, then it's flexible, easy to use and we get good um, good output from the from a fuel standpoint and and on the carbon dioxide itself the wind i mean the renewables of of course they are free i mean you won't get any carbon at all it's 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 the best thing to happen right no emissions and everything's good for environment but then from a gas power standpoint it's going to be less than half from coal but it's and we are also talking about future technologies again this is something that I want to kind of introduce. Uh, we have, I mean, this technology is proven, but a little expensive. And again, something that as a as an industry, we need to look at carbon capture and sequestration, where we capture carbon that's coming out of the power plant and pushing it down way inside. So that's capturing and sequestration, and that would go down. And you know what we are saying is even the thermal power, which is the coal. We'll also adopt this technology in India very soon so that the carbon output is not to the environment, but actually pushed down and stored and locked. So that's another thing that's coming up. The co cost piece, the, the renewables is currently costly, but on a trajectory to come down. So it will definitely come down from a cost standpoint. Gas is reasonably priced today um, and, and so on. So. So I don't want to read through the whole comparison chart, but just enough to say that if combined uh, output is made together of gas and the renewables, it's good for the country, good for the economy, good for the um, overall environment situation as well. So uh, this, this is a complimentary thing that I just wanted to leave you guys with. And then finally, this is my conclusion. I didn't want to have too many slides. Wanted to take more questions as required. What we are recommending as a country to do and what, what are we recommending as an organization to do? What we need to do is invest quite a lot in a combination of wind, solar, battery storage. And of course, gas wherever we can. So, and this is investment, not necessarily from a I mean, from your organization, it's not about money. It's about investing your resources in doing further research in making these technologies much cheaper and much smarter. So the batteries, I'll keep saying that 30% of the global market right here in India, I think that's a big number to look at. And how can we as a country, the second one would be more for the government to look at phasing out the coal fired generation, not good for anyone. So the coal, I mean, already the projections are it will come down, but how can we accelerate the journey of going down from a heavily using coal to kind of moderate? And then we are asking every organization to increase funding in research to talk about the effective carbon sequestering and capture. And we're also talking about in the gas, natural gas itself, how can we use hydrogen? And this is again food for thought for all of us where pure hydrogen can act as a fuel. Probably a food for thought for all of us. How can we do that, right? So again, this, there's so much that we are talking about in terms of recommendations, both to the policy makers of the country, institutions like you, organizations like us. So we need to work as a partnership so that India as a country will meet all the energy demands in the most efficient and environment safe way. So this is the slide I'll leave you with and um, I'll stop here and I'll ask if people have any questions. Thank you, Uh, 
हेलो सर दिस इज श्रीधर यू आर ओके सो आई जस्ट वांटेड टू नो एज अ स्टूडेंट लेट्स से यूजी स्टूडेंट और पॉसिबली अ पीजी स्टूडेंट हाउ डू आई गेट यू नो स्टार्टेड विथ लेट्स से रिसर्च एंड कंट्रीब्यूशन इन टर्म्स ऑफ एनर्जी Uh, assuming that i don't uh, you know know anything uh, about uh, the research aspect and how can i contribute to you know uh, whatever you have mentioned in detail in your uh, you know in your slides so what is it uh, what is in it for the students to contribute in terms of energy yeah look i mean i i mean to be really honest i think they will need definitely a partnership from the industry right so a a a right industry contact will be the one they would need to kind of find out or harbor and a a guide who can help them through the process of uh, making contribution so i mean it might sound a little hazy but what i wanted to kind of tell you is either through you and to the uh, student community if, if they are on the call is try to figure out if they have industry contacts and if not of course work through your college to find get them and there is a lot of work that could be done the industry still needs a lot of hands to kind of move things forward so uh, if you get to the right group that's working on it and if there are opportunities for this students to make contributions and i'm sure there is a lot of work to be done hello hello am i audible sir you are uh, sir like i have a question from students point of view Uh, yeah. like uh, what are the courses that uh, they can uh, uh, undergo uh, uh, so that uh, they will become employable readily employable in industries uh, like you uh, like uh, general electric and uh, so on like what is the demand of the day uh i think i have been a little uh, clear again i don't know enough about uh, the curriculum that you guys teach so and that's my ignorance but uh, what i would say is uh, uh, do you guys have uh, solar um, energy storage subjects at all in your uh, i mean again i'm talking about very specific to how we talked about in the presentation but do you have that in your college uh, curriculum The yeah, I think things spaces. study a bit. Uh, they have an uh, a subject called operation and maintenance of solar electric systems. Okay, okay. Uh, the problem with that would be giving you a theoretical understanding, but in India we are not still ramped up, like I said earlier, in terms of solar manufacturing. So while it gives them a good insight of uh, the solar, how it works, and and what not, but. i would expect again this is a recommendation only of course uh, you guys know the best what works for your students i would recommend that the storage piece will need to be included at some point of time during their course work because i see more and more emphasis coming into the storage aspect and if they do any real life projects uh, on the battery storage it could be lithium iron i mean initially but uh, but but i'm i'm sure there is a lot of work that they can learn through their initial years in your college but coming out they have so much exposure but storage piece is something that i would hope that you guys will have somehow in your curriculum if it doesn't work i think there are online courses also where you could do i i could look up and give you those maybe as a action item to tell you what they can study outside of their just college uh, textbooks that you go they go through Uh, that can make them a little more industry ready again i'm talking purely in terms of technology okay thank you sir you are welcome participants please post your questions in the chat box Uh, sir this is uh, shridhar again uh, yes so i have just uh, one more question for you uh, so i am uh, i am working more on the networks aspect and uh, there we work uh, more on uh, you know the uh, 
the nodes and uh, you know how the battery life and uh, you know those kind of things so in your opinion how do you see uh, the uh, the the battery uh, you know the movement of battery or the research on battery moving uh, you know forward with uh, you know 5g being deployed and 6g you know coming in another decade or so so how do you see this battery issues being resolved or where do you see uh, you know industry moving in regard to batteries look i think uh, connectivity is something that you're solving now right i mean the 5g ps and you are working on the network side so the connectivity portion is what you're trying to solve i think the other side of the story would be uh, not just the connectivity but the storage and question that we talked about how can we keep it for a longer duration today the batteries dissip dissipate pretty quickly right i mean the di dissipation is faster so how could we retain it for a longer duration is the million dollar question that i am hoping that people like you will solve so the emphasis on um, storing it not dissipating for a longer time of course making it available due to on the network piece which is what you're working on is very important too uh, so i would think the storage is important which is still to be solved you guys are going ahead and solving the next question of the network connectivity and and making sure that it is kind of applied to the grid where required and what not so you're solving the second problem the first problem is something unfortunately we have not been able to crack so far so that is where i see a lot of uh, r and d going on not just in india across the globe but i think so far we have not made any breakthrough technologies at least not that is widely used at this point of time thank you sir thank you you're welcome yes uh, this is lalita again i just wanted to know like uh, if uh, any internship opportunities are available for students of private colleges across the country because i think uh, usually the recruitment would be through uh, for nits and iits maybe uh, ge will be doing most of the recruitments but uh, at least internship opportunity or something will be available for uh, open to all is it there i will have to check i am no ex hr person so i can find out and let you guys know if there are internship opportunities um, but the recruitment for uh, regular positions i believe happens through the campus drives that they do in nits and iits like you said but i can find out on the internships fine that would be very helpful to us like if your stu our students can get some sort of uh, on hand like on field idea that would yeah yeah oh, understand i hope i didn't delay people's lunch or whatever so <laughs> I think few of the faculty and students are posting the questions. So just. Oh, they are okay. There is faculty. She was a mad bird. The question goes as uh, as on which factor okay, can nice. we can decide or take call. Okay, so on which factor can, we can decide or take call of selection of the particular source that solar, wind, hydrothermal, or gas? Okay, look, uh, I don't know uh, if it's okay. I'll try to answer. I don't know if it will answer correctly uh, to Sri Vatsap's question, but I'll make an attempt. So solar is solar and wind are obvious. I mean, you got to do project studies before you say this place is good for solar or this place is good for wind. Wind more so because wind needs a real source for the the turbines to rotate. So it should have a you know the land that is facing a huge gusts of wind most of the time. Proximity to natural resources. Pro I mean, real. It shouldn't have any urban landscape. clear clear land uh, scaping etc so there are some guidelines for wind for sure and solar now we are gone to a stage where you could put solar on practically any rooftop so so that that's i mean solar doesn't have too much of constraints in that sense hydro of course you need to have that um, you know the reservoirs and the projects to be built only then you could do that thermal and gas again thermal is 
probably a little simpler in India because coal is not that big of a problem in terms of availability. Gas is where we have a challenge because there is no natural natural gas source in India as such. Uh, but if you if the question is uh, which one to pick if you need consistent reliable power, uh, that would be what I would go back to what I said earlier where I said solar and wind are great because they are free uh, once you install it but then they are not consistent so you can't produce them all the time through the day so you that is when you will have to join that with thermal and gas so um, depends on i mean if it's a household all you can do is solar but if you are a bigger industry and if you have a captive power requirements uh, you could look at thermal or gas in conjunction with the solar and wind so it's a combination is there any scope for startups? I don't know if uh, um, that's a question for me, uh, but if it is, um, yeah, I mean, any idea is important, right? I mean, there are people, um, I mean, this happened what, six, seven years back or eight years back, I don't know. Someone came up out, came out and said in US that there is a very small chip sized uh, power plant anyone can carry. So that was an idea and they did work on it, but it didn't work. Uh, but who knows, uh, maybe uh, whoever didn't put their name might have a great idea that could help solve this problem, right? So like I keep saying, there could be a silver bullet that all of us are missing in terms of uh, how can we make this um, uh, the, the storage problem go away or how can we com combine, uh, how can we even reduce the cost of the carbon sequestration that I talked about? So there are many challenges here. So if the startup's role is just to give an idea and a proof of concept in a very small manner, that's also good, right? So you don't need to be end to end because there are many players here. Even an idea will do. So I think the same question was asked twice. So I, I, I hope I've answered that question. Yeah. I have one more query like all the time when, like, when we are speaking about uh, gas in India as such, we speak about natural gas or CNG, whereas outside it is actually synonymous with petrol and all right. The way the way moment they say gas, it is our petrol. And when the research is happening, they are saying like like uh, you have um, hybrid vehicles to increase, improve the um, range and all. So a part of the research is into the hybrid vehicles. But uh, uh, pure gas vehicles like uh, we, we know like uh, we have been seeing auto and all uh, being running on the gas. Is there an, a, any attempt uh, at, like uh, to mix up uh, renewable with gas and all in the research thing? Look, uh, I, th I don't know if the question uh, I'll clarify, right? Um, I'll clarify first the gas that I meant is natural gas regardless, right? I mean, even in in the other countries where you said gas would mean petrol, that's the gasoline side, which I'm not touching. I mean, we're not talking about that. So it's just the natural gas piece, whether it is in India or across the globe. So that's one. So the second piece on the hybrid uh, portion of uh, the transportation sector, I think that's what you meant, where the portion of uh, the, the car, car is driven partly by your fossil fuels, could be diesel, petrol or whatever, and part would be your electric portion kicking in with the charge coming in, right? So I think that's what you're talking about in the transportation sector. Transportation sector, I would say, is far ahead of the game. Uh, they are doing much better than the power sector. Uh, power sector is still struggling to meet the less carbon, carbon emissions and, and, and um, efficiencies in technologies, whereas um, if you look at the transportation sector, even the challenge is smaller. It is just running your car right, from point A to point B. So their challenge is much smaller in terms of how much they, how much power you need. Whereas power sector, it's a huge one. I mean, it, you need to light up maybe 1 million homes, for example, one, one plant. Then imagine you can't just do away with what you're doing today. You can't, I mean, the, the alternative is, is a little more complex because batteries for cars are smaller and, you know, they are charging up, they, they get charged up quickly and you're running from point A to point B from a vehicular transport standpoint. But power sector, 
we don't have a silver bullet yet. It's it's going to take some time, and I hope uh, all of us can work on it too. Uh, where you know the the portion of renewables and the thermal, which is what we talked about, will happen. Today it happens only at the grid where all these pump in their energy and the grid does the balancing and, and priority, etc. But what we are talking about in a few, few minutes back is a producer. The power producer itself will have this balanced out. Portion of it comes from gas. I'm again saying because I come from gas, but portion of it comes from you know a thermal, portion of it comes from wind, solar, etc. So moving down the grid balancing act from the real grid to the producer. There any? Yeah, I see a couple. Uh, there was a thank you. OK, there's a couple of thank yous. OK. Are there any other questions that I'll be happy to answer? Uh, hello, sir. This is Sridhar again. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I was uh, listening to your uh, uh, the part on uh, storage. So yeah. uh, my the idea of storage that I have again from a networking background. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, basically put uh, we the uh, storage is required for our own applications. For example, if we take uh, a telephone, uh, you mm -hmm. know, still we don't need any storage if we were still doing voice calls. So mm -hmm. that uh, you know the trunk call is still okay, the copper cable is still okay, yep. but the storage demands are basically because of our applications. Right. So that is the idea that I have in terms of uh, you know uh, a, a calling or uh, in terms of networking. Mm -hmm. uh, but what exactly does it uh, mean uh, by store? Uh, what exactly do you mean by storage in terms of you know uh, say electrical engineering in uh, that case? Right? Do you mean the storage, battery storage, and those kind of things? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll maybe in my it was my bad that I didn't explain. Thank you for the questions reader. So so for example, to charge my phone, for example, to charge my phone, I need power to come out from my power socket. And and the way today I do is I connect to my I mean AC uh, and then I just run it right. So the power flows because there is power input coming from the substation and uh, the transformer etc i mean again i don't want to get there you guys are masters there and you will be <coughs> beat me down there so what i'm saying is there is a source of power for me and i'm connecting to it and drawing my energy to my cell phone to charge it but let's assume that this power comes from solar pure solar the solar again like i said the 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 way it does it it, it keeps producing the 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 power output only when the sun is out. So when the sun is off, it just disappears, right? Typically what we do is we put that into an inverter and it converts the, you know, and, and, and pushes the power out. So after the inverter runs out of the storage that it had, I can't charge my battery anymore because there will be no input to the inverter itself because so it's night time and there is no solar power. So if that is the only source of power for me, I will run out of it very soon. That was my idea, Sridhar, where I'm talking about if I don't build this storage to last for days and months, and I don't know when we'll get there. If I have the capability of a battery that stores this solar energy all the time and wind energy all the time, store it, for a longer duration, without dissipation, without loss in efficiencies, I can happily connect to this wonderful resources of our globe, of our earth rather, without paying too much attention to the cost and the duration. It's free and my life is great because I'm not polluting. I have a unlimited source of power from sun, great source from uh, the wind also. So if I don't, if I build this great storage in between, then I'm done. I'm, I, I'll be happy to run my operations forever. But the problem is they are limited. OK, it was, now, now, now I'm very clear because uh, storage for me just means data storage. Oh. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, I'm like a kind of uh, not very open about the storage part, but this uh, uh, made it very uh, clear to me what exactly it, uh, it means. So thank you very much. 
Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So are there any more questions? Uh, one just last question from my side. Uh, is it is there any possibility that we can uh, uh, from the waste matter? Is it possible that we can substitute a part of the power? Is it like is it scalable that way? I I could, not hope, hear uh, you. I could uh, make it. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yeah, coming in and going out. So at least I couldn't hear you well. You want to try asking again? OK, I uh, 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 means natural means uh, what I mean is it's a bio uh, substitute a part of portion of the energy requirement. Are there any efforts in that, that direction from GE? I OK, so I think if I got your question right, you talked about bioenergy. So I mean, I hope that's right. So we had a business uh, that runs on the gas. I mean, the methanes, the bio gases of the world. Uh, we had it um, till about three years back, which is when we divested it. So it's still a Austrian company called Yen Backer. It still runs. So there is definitely bioenergy that's captured. And in fact, it was in my chart that I showed you as one of the fuels. So that also will be very flat in terms of growth. Uh, but that's one of the source too. Yes. Fine. Thank you, sir, for the enriching and thought provoking session. Yeah, yeah, more, yeah, most I time. request. Uh, yes, sir. sir uh, I request Dr. Sridhar Iyer to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, I would like to start by thanking. Uh, Sir, for firstly accepting uh, our invitation. It was a very prompt uh, acceptance from Sir, and he also provided uh, the details which uh, we required. Uh, even though uh, generally we, uh, you know, the the idea that we have is that uh, people who work in industry are very, very busy, and I would assume the same with Sir as well. But Sir was very, very prompt. In fact, within uh, the next five to ten minutes after sending the email, I got Sir's response. So thank you very much, Sir, for uh, your very prompt response. And uh, uh, regarding the webinar, uh, it's an eye opener, especially for uh, for me because. Uh, you know, uh, working on the energy issues and uh, having these uh, natural resources, but still not being able to tap them to the fullest is an open problem for research uh, that so many people are looking for. And we read like so many books and journals and articles uh, looking for open problems, but these open problems are there right in front of us. And if we can really think and tap these, uh, you know, natural open problems, then there's a lot of research to be done. The other aspect which uh, I think you made very clear was uh, that the industry and the academia have to join hands uh, to find uh, you know uh, feasible solutions to uh, you know existing problems uh, and so many are there. So that's an eye opener for us and uh, you also answered few questions on how the students could uh, you know engage themselves in uh, providing solutions to these challenges uh, which exist in our country uh, and uh, the energy demands of India are just growing uh, from what I have read and I, I'm sure you also agree. So there's a lot of solutions to be provided. Uh, so uh, you provided an insight uh, on this webinar on the energy demands and uh, especially in our country. So uh, on behalf of uh, SGBIT, our uh, respected principal sir and uh, HOD ma'am of Tripoli department and all other faculty members and 
participants and students. I would like to thank you so much, uh, sir, for uh, uh, giving us this insight through this webinar. Uh, I would also like to thank our uh, respected principal, sir, who always, uh, uh, Dr. SVT, sir, who always encourages us to have uh, these kind of uh, webinars, uh, especially from industry uh, uh, people, so that we can get an insight uh, on what uh, is happening in the industries in terms of R&D. Thank you so much, sir. I would also like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Suparna, ma'am, uh, HOD uh, EEE department for uh, having this uh, webinar organized. Uh, uh, thank you very much, ma'am. I would also like to thank uh, Naresh sir, Lalita ma'am, Manjula ma'am, and all the faculty of uh, EEE department uh, who uh, who engaged this webinar from uh, sir uh, in association with the R&D cell. So thank you very much. And uh, last but not the least, all the participants, uh, students uh, who are present, and uh, I'm sure they got a lot of insight uh, uh, from this webinar. Uh, thank you one and all. Uh, thank you, sir. I request all the participants to please turn on their video so that we can take a screenshot. So could I leave map or uh, is there anything else for me? It's be there. Uh, I thank everyone for the participation in the webinar. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye, sir.